Hi, everyone. So uh, Ismail and I worked on the uh, Caterpillar tube pricing Kaggle, which I'll describe now. This is the screenshot from Kaggle. So this is a closed competition. Uh, there were about 1,300 teams. And uh, basically, it was predicting the prices of tube assemblies. So this is a regression problem onto the cost as a numerical variable for uh, tube assemblies, which I will talk about now. So Caterpillar is one of the biggest companies in the world. And one of the things they do is manufacture heavy equipment for construction projects. Um, so like cranes, backhoes, bulldozers, things like that. So in the construction of these large machines, they need a lot of tubes and tube assemblies. This is an artist's rendering of a tube assembly. And it has a few uh, basic elements. So this is the tube. And um, these are the components. And there are many different kinds of components. So there are a lot of variables in tube assemblies. There are thousands of different tube assemblies. And again, our job was to predict the price of the tube assembly uh, given data about the tube assembly. OK, so for the challenge, um, Caterpillar provided a, a lot of data. So we had to deal with about 21 different CSV files. So there's a lot of information regarding tube assemblies. And for example, uh, if you look here, the tube, uh, tube underscore DF, so that, 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 that uh, file just contained information about the tube, meaning the, just the gray area, so the number of bends, uh, the radius, the wall thickness. So there's a lot of information to take into account. And uh, when going into the, the data, trying to understand each file um, and each uh, variable, we came af across different issues. So first was uh, there were NANs in the categorical data. So we approached that by um, making them into factor levels, so new NAN factor levels. And we also had missingness in numerical data. So we did uh, imputation using the mean. Next, also, uh, the factor variables could not be used for our uh, data analysis. So we instead um, converted, converted them into dummy variables. Next, also, there was a date variable. So this, this was not a time series. This was more of a time stamp. So it was not continuous. So instead, we converted this into days after the earliest date. So the er earliest date was um, like 0, and then it was days, at, days after that earliest date. And finally, probably the most challenging for us was the tube assemblies had different components. And so we approached that uh, using feature engineering, wherein we, 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 we pretty much tried to use as, as much information as we could, uh, given all the, all the files that were given. And uh, this resulted for us in um, two, two data frames, which we called basic and component. So the basic data frame had um, uh, basic feature engineering, and the components one had uh, a lot more feature engineering. So uh, the first row is the number of columns of each data frame. Uh, so we used three uh, tree-based models uh, for this problem. The first one is uh, decision trees. We also tried random forests, and we tried uh, gradient boosting. So again, all tree-based methods. So we had a few expectations going into this, the, the modeling attempt. The first one was that all the models fitted to the components data frame, which as Ismail pointed out, had more uh, feature engineering and basically just more data, that those models would strictly outperform the, uh, the basic data frame, um, just because they had more data to work with. In addition, we perhaps naively uh, thought that the gradient boosting methods would outperform the random forests, which would outperform the decision trees. Um, certainly that the gradient boosting and random forest should outperform the decision trees. But really, we, that was kind of what we thought uh, going in. So this is a, a plot of, our, of the performance of some of our models. So I just want to spend a, a moment explaining what you're looking at. Um, on the x-axis, you have uh, different attempts we made to use decision trees to model performance. So this in chronological order. So A1, and then later we tried A2, and so on. Uh, on the y-axis, this is the percentage of teams uh, that we outperformed when we submitted to Kaggle. Okay, so the bigger the bar is, the better we performed um, with that model. And then the red and the blue correspond to which data frame we were using. So the red is for the basic, and uh, the blue is for the components which had more data. So early on in our attempt to make these decision trees, it went about as you'd expect. Um, the components outperformed a little bit, the basic, um, and then we were kind of tuning that and getting kind of better as time went on. Um, 
However, uh, at, at going from A1 to A3, we were increasing and changing the range of grid points that we used during our parameter tuning. Um, so that's why the, the performance kind of was improving. Here, we actually changed the parameters we were looking at when we uh, were building the tree. And I can talk about that in the question period. I don't really want to get into it now. A4 consumed more computational resources and more time than the other three combined. So that was going to be our big, okay, here we go. We found the right parameters. Let's really get into this. Um, and it performed terribly. Uh, it performed significantly worse than the others. And e even more confusing than that, the, the model that was fitted to the components data frame, which had more data, was much worse <laughs> than the one that had uh, less data. So this was a, a very confounding sort of uh, experience for us. This is for the random forest. These are two of the attempts we made, and we see a very similar thing here. Early on, uh, you know, components is just slightly outperforming basic. Um, but then we changed the parameters that we were searching over, and again, A2 was given a lot more computational resources than A1 was, ours. And um, it performed significantly worse. So that was another, another very confusing sort of experience we had. <laughs> um, then, so that was for random forest. For gradient boosting, it was actually even more extreme. So our first attempt for, it's not literally our first attempt, but the first attempt I'm showing <laughs> is um, that there wasn't a significant difference in the performance of the uh, models for the uh, basic and component data frames. When we put in a lot more computational resources and searched over different parameters, we couldn't submit the results to Kaggle at all. Kaggle refused to take these results. And what Ismail uh, no noted uh, after looking at the file we submitted was that um, this model, this gradient boosting model, which we gave a lot of computational resources, was predicting negative values for the costs. And um, that is nonsensical. That would be like I, you know, Caterpillar asks the supplier for a tube assembly, and the tube assembly supplier insists on paying Caterpillar for the privilege of giving a tube assembly. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So that, that was nonsense, and we, we did not submit those results at all. So that was particularly confusing, that now we go from having at least some, and by the way, these are pretty poor results for gradient boosting. I mean, we expected more than that. That's outperforming about 8% of the people that submitted. And then it went from 8% to being not usable at all. This was the model we thought would do the best. We were wrong. Um, so uh, this is the best performance for each of the paradigms that we had in trying to do, uh, deal with this problem. So the decision tree in random forest performed about the same, um, not terribly considering you know, we didn't do any ensembling or stacking. Um, the gradient boosting method was significant. The best gradient boosting model was worse than the worst of either of the other two for us based on our attempts. Um, so again, looking at our, our expectations, we thought the component data frame would perform better. That was not consistently observed. It did not consistently outperform the basic data frame. Um, the models fitted to the basic data frame. And furthermore, we did not uh, observe this. We did, I mean, again, uh, we thought this would be about the order we could expect to see performance, and it, it just wasn't that at all. So next, um, you know, uh, the lessons that we gathered from our expectations and the results that we had from running uh, those different models. So first was the more data didn't clearly improve performance. As Adam mentioned, the, the models that were run on the components data frame didn't consistently outperform the models that were run on the basic data frame. Also, uh, the more complex tree-based methods such as random forest and gradient boosting didn't clearly outperformed the decision tree. This was also interesting given that um, we gave it more computational resources in terms of time and um, the grid points to search over. And um, this highlighted uh, tuning parameter issues. So first, uh, which parameters to, to tune on? Um, if you remember uh, when Adam um, pointed out early on the dotted line, so we changed our tuning parameter to tune on, and so that, that uh, largely changed the results of our model. Also, uh, consequences of suboptimal parameter values. So this was interesting because uh, if I go back to the results from the gradient boosting performance, if you notice the first attempt, A1, um, we actually got the exact same results from the model trained on the basic and the model trained on the components. So uh, this was an interesting find at first, and then we, when we dug into it, um, it seemed that because we gave the model like a limited, a limited range 
of grid points to, to tune on, it actually wasn't looking into the new variables that the components data frame reflected. Hence, it was giving the exact same results as the basic, uh, basic data frame. And finally, uh, what we found beneficial was the importance of logging tuning runs and model fits. So um, taking into account like what, 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 uh, what tuning parameters we did, the, the range we, we looked over, um, and how that and how that was changing our uh, performance when we submitted to Kaggle. So uh, improvements for the for future work. Um, we, we, again, as Ismail just said, we we had really good experiences logging exactly what every attempt to tune the model resulted in, and in the future we plan on doing uh, that even more so. So on what day, at what time did we try? What range of parameters? What was the R squared? That would be, a, I think that would really help in the process. Um, furthermore, uh, the, we, we were hoping at a more basic programming level to uh, write our own uh, tree building algorithm because the, the tree building algorithm now splits on kind of a greedy RSS reduction model for regression. But that's not what we're being scored on for Kaggle. What we're being scored on for Kaggle is the Kaggle metric. So we were thinking it would be interesting to program a tree which greedily splits on the Kaggle metric instead of RSS reduction. Uh, and selects parameters based on that. It seems like a more targeted approach. We haven't done that. Um, and then fi finally, to, to use something like Spark to do some, uh, some parallel processing and hopefully search more parameters, because uh, that is usually a good idea. So anyway, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I suppose a, the we had the choice of you know using the mean or um, a max or a min or or um, you know like the median. So we so we chose the mean to be sort of like a conservative approach, given that the missingness was in 30 observations out of the 60,000 in this variable called bend radius. So uh, we thought that was a more conservative approach. That's why we used the mean. And I suppose the detraction would be that uh, if, if these 30 observations were outliers, then uh, that would change the results of, of, of the analysis, or th that would skew the results the, of the analysis towards, you know, it, it wouldn't reflect them as outliers. Yes. We were scanning to see whether there would be some obvious reason there wouldn't be. So, oh, sorry. Exactly. And for one thing that we checked is, for instance, there would be in one column there was an integer which is number of bends, right? So one thing I wanted to know was, well, maybe there are no bends in these, and that's where there's no bend radius. But we checked that, and there was no, that wasn't it. And there wasn't a correlation with, well, it's only missing when there are three bends or something. It was, we did that for a number of variables, but we didn't see any anything going on there. And also, again, there were 30 missing in 60,000, so it, it didn't seem like a very judicious use of our time to do like k-nearest neighbors or something on that few variables. Absolutely, always. No, your point's taken, yeah. <clears throat>
Okay, uh, maybe I'll take a stab okay. at this first. Sure. Okay, so um, in terms of the sets that we used, so there were, there were uh, just to recap, so there was the basic and the components data frame, so those were split entirely differently. Okay, you're not confused about that. So then, uh, so we used tenfold cross-validation, that was for all of the methods. Um, we, we didn't hold aside any test data, we cross-validated on, on everything. Um, and in terms of, I'm not sure exactly if I'm answering your question, but we searched, what the dotted line represents is we actually changed the parameters over which we were searching. Um, that's what dis dis distinguishes the left side of that from the right side of that. I feel like I'm not answering your question. What, what was your question? Yeah, so like for example, A1. Yeah. How does A1, like if for A1 you search for A1, you look at A1. Sure, okay. It's similar. Right. And so with A1, what did you do? We did simple cross-validation on A1 over a certain parameter. Correct. And then what's the difference between A1 and A2 first? Ah, um, as I recall, we changed the grid that we were searching over based on the best parameters selected from the first attempt. Okay, so A2 is kind of pulling in on the reading. Right. right. Okay. And also, I'm so, and just to elaborate on that, as we went on, we, we increased a little bit more each time how much time we were going to devote to this process because we had increasing confidence that that would like pay off. So I don't I don't think we we ran each of these for the exact same amount of time. We would like say, well, that's the best parameter, so let's search there and let's give that a little bit more time this time. Right. So, so um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the difference, hold on. Okay, so um, this this summarizes summarizes the uh, our different attempts with the decision tree um, tuning. So um, yeah, so in the first three attempts, we we were tuning over these two parameters, the min samples leaf and the min samples split. And then for the fourth attempt, um, we, wherein we thought of giving it more computational resources, we, we instead tuned on one, one tuning param parameter, which is the max leaf node. So we, we, we gave that, uh, we got the best was 280. So Does this answer your question? No, I, so um, what we found with all the tree building algorithms and most obviously in decision tree is that there are many ways you can tell the computer how you want to stop growing the tree and that these overlap with each other. So we, w we were confused about which parameters to tune over because of course ideally you'd want, uh, there were like seven ways to specify that. So we could have tuned over all seven but then we wouldn't have many options for each of them. So our first guess was let's take two which are min sample leaf and min sample split. We tuned over those for a while, but then we kind of got into this weird kind of uh, conversation about why are we tuning over two when we're not even sure those have the best result. Let's just tune one that we can understand the clearest and give it a really big range. So you tune one at a time and then you tune the rest? Yes, I don't remember us setting even the optimal parameters for the other one, because there's overlap between these. They don't, they're not totally different parameters. We, it was a confusing thing for us, and obviously we didn't make a very good decision because our, pr our performance dropped so precipitously after making that switch. D is, is that getting at what you're?
Yeah, so the Kaggle metric was um, a variation of the mean squared error. It was like a root logarithmic mean square error. error. Yeah. Uh, we didn't look, look into it further. Yeah. 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 Do you want to take that? Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, uh, we made two different data frames. So one one had more feature engineering, the other uh, and the other one had less. But uh, the feature engineering in general, we wanted to capture um, the information that was contained in the other files. So I, I guess I just wonder, maybe with a possible explanation for why the gradient group thing mm. didn't do as well is that mm. maybe there was some data leakage. I don't know what that means. Mm, I'm not sure what what. Like what uh, a lot of variables that are correlated, highly correlated with each other, and when you only do a subset of them, those that data is still contained in that subset, so there's a risk for overfitting. Wouldn't, we, that, be, wouldn't we, that be addressed uh, by the cross validation or not? Uh, it would be, but. Sorry, were you, uh, were you referring to the, the decision tree was overfitting or the gradient boosting was over? Um, actually, we, when our similar problem is that we combined CSPs together, mm. and actually we, we stopped doing it because it, there was some data leakage in there, like, like that we talked about. Country population was actually too directly correlated to our final Y mm. variable that we're interested in, so we had to take it out. Um, with regard to uh, your concern about overfitting, I, I don't think our uh, boosting model is overfitting because when our, uh, our training error was actually a lot worse than our training error in the decision tree and the random forest. So, yeah, honestly, like, like it could, it could be, we didn't really understand what was going on. It, it, uh, yeah, I don't think it's overfitting either, but I, I think in terms of what you're saying about these, these different variables being, variables being correlated, absolutely. I mean, we spent days trying to understand the engineering part of it, and um, there are a lot of variables that are absolutely related to each other. So that could be. I mean, we, the first thing I would think is EDA, which we did try to do to see whether there were natural correlations. We didn't find any serious offenders based on our EDA, but that would be the first thing. Um, uh, oh, I suppose regularization, so uh, lasso or ridge regression. Uh, uh, I suppose lasso, since it would bring down the coefficients to z zero. That is true. So P are you referring to PCA? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really nice. <laughs>